Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is democratic accountability. The big question we're going to address in this lecture is why are autocratic leaders less responsive to their citizens than democratic leaders are? I want to review something back to last unit when we talked about this Persian Gulf War example with Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Kuwait. Remember that war is costly, but there are perhaps some benefits to be gained by fighting a war. If you're an autocrat, it's easy to buy off a small number of people. Remember that as an autocrat, you only have to appease a few people to stay in power. This isn't a democracy where you need at least half of the citizens to support you. You just need to buy off a few important people. So if you were Saddam Hussein back in 1991 or back in 1990, you could steal Kuwaiti oil, go ahead and invade Kuwait, start stealing their oil, and use that money to buy off your cronies. And you're not paying very much of those costs of war because it's other guys who are, you're just forcing to go out and fight that war. So if they die, who really cares? Not your problem. You have very little cost to pay and very great benefits to be gained by stealing that oil. In contrast, it's hard to buy off a large number of people. If you were to try to pull off that plan in the United States, you'd have a problem, first of all, because all of those people who are going out and fighting the war and paying those costs, well, they are going to be the ones who are re-electing you, and they're going to have families and friends who are going to be re-electing you. So that's a problem for you as a leader. And then also, what are you going to do with all of that Kuwaiti oil money? It's not like you can just split it among a few people. You're going to be splitting it among 300 million people in the United States. That's a lot more people, and that means per person, very little money is being tossed around. So it's not a really good way of gaining support. So as the last point says, since democracies share the burden of war relatively equally, democratic leaders have less incentive to fight. So the takeaway point from this review is that autocrats appear to find war more attractive since they don't pay the costs. Now, this should scream principal agent problem here because this means that if you take a representative citizen out of one of these autocratic countries, this representative citizen would choose a different policy than the autocratic leader is. And that's a problem if you're living in that country. So how do we resolve that problem? Well, remember we had the slide before. The first plan was to find an agent with aligned preferences. But as a citizen in an autocratic country, you don't really have control over who is the leader of your country. You can't change the agent. Remember, you're the principal here. You're the people of the country are the principal. But this agent is sort of just living there and taking over the place, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you can't just change agents if you're a citizen living in an autocracy. You can't remove autocrats from power unlike you could in a democracy. So you can't resolve the principal agent problem through step one. So what about step two? Could you monitor these rogue agents, these autocrats who are engaging in war policies that you as the representative citizen don't really like. Well, oversight only goes so far if the agent doesn't care. Remember, the agent is really shielded here. This autocrat is really shielded from any sort of punishment from you as the citizen because he's in power, he has all of the power, and you have very little power because you don't even have the power to vote. So monitoring these rogue autocrats doesn't really do you very much good here. The last thing you could do is change the incentive structure to keep rogue agents in line. But there's a big difference between how this works in democratic countries and autocratic countries. So let's think about the incentive structures for both of these guys and see how they vary between democracies and autocracies. In a democracy, obviously, you can find agents with aligned preferences and elect them into power and then monitor them using these checks and balances. And you can't really do that with these autocrats. So think about fighting a bad war, democratic leader versus autocratic leader. A democratic leader is going to be facing re-election at some point. An autocratic leader will likely, or be very unlikely rather, to face any real electoral competition. They might have fake elections that are rigged, but they're not going to be in serious threat of losing their power. Democratic leaders will be less likely to win re-election if they fight bad wars. And again, because of the last bullet point here, autocratic leaders don't really have to care about vote counts. So what the heck? It doesn't really matter for them if they go out and fight a bad war. Another important point, and this really gets overlooked a lot, is that democratic leaders have party officials pressuring them to do the right thing, whereas autocratic leaders have cronies encouraging him to do the selfish thing so they share the benefits. This is Saddam Hussein's cronies saying, hey, yeah, we should definitely go invade Kuwait because if we get that oil money, you're going to be sharing it with us, and that makes us happy too. This is in contrast to democratic leaders who have party officials who don't want him to do bad things because it reflects poorly on them, and they have different incentive structures. 
that might have different time horizons than the president. So you might be concerned that, hey, you know, President Obama, he's in his last term in office. He doesn't even have to care about re-election anymore, so he can do whatever he wants. So imagine he just said tomorrow, Canada, hey, let's go ahead and nuke them, right? This isn't going to go very far. Why? Think about this. Well, Joe Biden is going to be like, dude, I'm trying to run for president here, and that's not going to be doing me a very good favor, right? I don't want you to do something crazy because I have to be able to run for president later on, and whatever you do reflects either good on me or poorly on me, and so I want to make sure we do the right policy, and that means we don't invade Canada. And, you know, we have other people around him saying similar things, right? So as a leader in a democratic country, it's not just you you have to get on your side. It's also these other people who have competing preferences, who actually want to do the right thing for the country, want to do the right thing for the representative citizen, so their electoral chances are good in the future. It's also important to note that wars usually have bipartisan support in democratic countries. So even if you look at, for example, the Iraq War, the Iraq War in 2002, when they actually had a vote on whether the president should have the authorized power to go ahead and use force against Iraq, this actually had a lot of bipartisan support. Obviously, you can see here that uh, Republicans virtually unanimous, unanimously supported the resolutions both in the House and the Senate. You can only see a very small, darker red, which represents the Republicans who voted no against the resolution, which is barely even visible there. In contrast, we have some some actual variation between the, uh, the Democrats, but you'll see that there's actually substantial Democratic support for the Iraq War resolution. You can see in the Senate, a majority of Democrats, 29% versus 21% in the Senate, actually favored the Iraq War resolution, whereas the House, you see a majority of the Democrats within the House voting against the war, but you still see substantial support. About 40% of the Democratic House members actually voted for the war. So this wasn't just Bush's policy. There was actually substantial bipartisan support for this war. This is part of that checks and balances system where presidents really want to get bipartisan support precisely because they are afraid that if they don't, then this will be viewed as a politically motivated campaign versus something that's actually good for the country. So the takeaway point here is that autocratic Autocrats in firm control have very little reason to appease their citizens, and I guess there's a second takeaway point here, which is the opposite, which is that democratic leaders face electoral accountability and checks and balances, and therefore they have reason to appease their citizens, to do what the representative citizen would actually want them to do. Now, something that's been missing from this entire conversation so far is what actually happens to leaders once they retire, right? So we're not just concerned about whether we're staying in power or not, but we're also concerned about what happens if we leave power. And so in the next time, we'll actually start taking this seriously and we'll be looking at leaders' retirement plans, both in democracies and in autocracies. Hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Bye now.